We are part of Great Britain, the most loyal part of Great Britain. On a winter's day in 1988, mourners bore three of their comrades to the Republican plot. They'd been shot dead by the SAS in Gibraltar. The leaders of the Republican movement, Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness, stood at the graveside in Belfast's Milltown Cemetery. The explosion had been caused by a hand grenade thrown by a loyalist who'd infiltrated the crowd. The attacker was called Michael Stone, a member of the Ulster Freedom Fighters, the UFF. Stone's lone onslaught left three men dead. To loyalists, Stone was a hero who'd fearlessly taken the war to the enemy. Others pursued the same strategy. It was a message to the IRA and the Republicans, or the lifeless community. If they're going to do that to us, we're going to do this to you. So you tell them to stop. Loyalists intensified their campaign a decade ago against the IRA and the nationalist community. They felt they were hitting back. Now it seemed that the ancient victories that power their songs had meaning once again. the paramilitaries are not seen as psychopaths and sectarian bigots, but as defenders of their community against IRA genocide. I just got tired of seeing Protestants slaughtered. The mate was all one-way traffic. The army and the police couldn't do nothing about it. So I thought loyalist paramilitaries or whatever loyalist people had to do it themselves. Can you remember holding a gun for the first time? I can't remember holding a gun for the first time. It was just like a feeling nobody could touch me. Just felt like I was a soldier and that was it. Did you feel a different person with a gun in your hand? I did feel a different person. In what way? It's very hard to explain it. It's... It was like being on a hive, you can understand it. Like, you got a buzz from it. The Loyalist offensive against the IRA in Belfast triggered a murderous cycle of tit-for-tat killings, culminating in the death of a senior UVF commander. In retaliation, the UVF targeted a leading Republican. What did you plan to do? He used to be executed. Murdered? Well, you call it murder. I call it shot. How were you going to do it? 
Travel to his house. Hopefully we'll get him in. Do you walk up to the door and ring the bell? No, I think his door might have had to be put in. Put in with what? Sledgehammer. Is that the way those things were done? Yeah. Unless you touch lock and he left the door open for you. What happened? On the way to it, we were intercepted by the police. Jerry Spence was sentenced to 15 years for conspiracy to murder. The IRA's Enniskillen bomb epitomised what loyalists believed they were fighting against. Eleven Protestants died in the dreadful carnage. Enniskillen was not unique. There were many atrocities like it. What did you want to do? Well, at that stage, I think I wanted to join the Ulster Defence Association to get out and pay back to what they were doing in my community. To hit back at them? To hit back, yes. To shoot them? To shoot them, to do whatever means possible. Mo Courtney was sentenced to seven years for armed robbery. There would have been trained weapons, explosives, a wee bit of intelligence work and stuff like that. How to gather intelligence and whatever, you know. And how to use the guns? And how to use the guns, yes. And make explosives? That's correct, yes. Although the UFF didn't stop terrorising the nationalist community, it now refined its strategy. It identified suspected IRA men and their supporters and killed them. Did you target Republicans? Yes. Did you try and kill Republicans? Yes. The attack on the young Catholic couple took place at the mobile home they moved into three months ago. I had information to say that he was an intelligence officer in the provisionals and I went to assassinate him. With what? With a 357 Magnum and a sawn off shotgun. At least two terrorists fired two shots through a window and door, which was locked, after they tried to force their way in. As I opened the door, a shot came through the door and blasted me in the arm. And I clasped that wound as a medal. Bobby Philpott was sentenced to 15 years for attempted murder. There were many such attacks, with loyalists bursting into people's homes and shooting them dead, sometimes in front of their children. But the gunmen weren't operating alone. How were you able to target Republicans in the way that you did? Security forces information. Which branches of the security forces? All, all branches. RDC, Army, UDR. You're saying that the Army, the RUC and the UDR and the police assisted you in the targeting and killing of Republicans? In targeting. In targeting. You or the UFF did the killing? Yes. Intelligence documents were being leaked to the UFF. They identified IRA suspects. Well, I was getting documents day and daily. I was getting that many documents that I didn't know where to put them. What sort of documents? Montages and intelligence reports. Photos? Photos. What colour socks Republicans were wearing, what colour jumpers were they were wearing, what sort of cars they drove. Where they lived, where they lived in different homes, which they regarded as safe houses. Could you, could the UFF have done what it did without that degree of help from inside the security forces? No. Nope. In the five years from 1989, Loyalist killed 26 members of the IRA, Sinn Féin, and their families. They also killed 120 Catholics who were not involved in the conflict.
But although few people knew it at the time, the Loyalist paramilitaries were also thinking about how to bring the conflict to an end and establish a peace in which the union they had been fighting to preserve would be guaranteed. To do this, the UVF adopted a twin-track approach, killing and talking at the same time. The killing was done in public, the talking in secret. The strategy was directed by a small group within the UVF leadership known as the Kitchen Cabinet. A leading member of the Cabinet was David Irvine, who developed his political ideas while serving an 11-year sentence for possession of explosives. He'd studied Sinn Féin's pronouncements and concluded the IRA was considering peace. That was the first glimmer that something was happening in the province. And, and that, that had to be followed up. It had to be reeled in. What's going on? Let's find out. And you had to respond? Well, I think, the, in essence, we, we had to, to, to understand and then had to gear people up for the capacity to respond. With loyalists now out-killing the IRA, there were secret moves in the UVF's inner sanctum to end the slaughter. The intermediary was, surprisingly, a Catholic trade unionist from Dublin, from a staunchly Republican background. Crucially, he could relay loyalist thinking to the Dublin government. It was part of the vital process of building up trust. Did you think they were serious in what they said about wanting peace? Um, yes, I did. I made a judgment call on one of the personalities that was there, and uh, I believed him in particular. And when he said to me, no matter what happens, no matter what happens outside, trust us that what we're saying you, to you is the truth as we know it, and we will always be honest with you. No matter what, no matter what atrocities happen, we will be always honest with you. And we are equally trying to work our way towards peace. There were also moves on the UDA side. Here, the intermediary was a Presbyterian clergyman. He became a regular attender at the meetings of the UDA's inner council. We talked at times about the future, about, about their children and grandchildren, if they were spared to have them. Did they want them to grow up in that atmosphere? Indeed, that was a very, a very telling uh, meeting that we had at that time when we started talking about the future and, and children and grandchildren. The, the, the answer was they certainly did not want their children and grandchildren to grow up in the, the atmosphere that they had grown up in and, and we moved from that. But to exercise the maximum influence and with the British government too, it was necessary to go higher. Roy McGee enlisted the support of the most senior Protestant churchmen in Ireland. How did the paramilitary leaders you were talking to strike you? When I knew they were coming, I wasn't sure what I would see. I saw a group of men well-groomed, well-dressed, nervous, But most of all, I saw a group of men who said, look, the time has come to talk. The time has come to see an alternative. But the tentative moves towards peace were torn apart when the IRA bombed a fish shop on the Shankill Road on a busy Saturday morning. The IRA claimed their target had been UFF leaders meeting upstairs. The office was empty. The fish shop was not. Billy McQuiston was in a pub nearby. It was just, just a merciful thud. And everybody automatically knew exactly what had happened. So everybody ran out the door. And as we ran out the door, you couldn't see in front of you dust. So we ran up to the building. And um, people were scrambling, trying to, trying to, trying to dig in the rubble. Um, and shouting, look, there's many people's in here, many people's in here, and things like that. And 
there's people, there's women standing screaming and, and, and crying and, and there's people walking about dazed. And it was just total another mayhem. The Shankill had not known such carnage since the early 70s. Nine Protestants were killed and one of the IRA bombers. Scores were injured. In the week after the Shankill bomb, loyalists retaliated by killing six Catholics. On the seventh night, Halloween, the UFF took terrible revenge. Masked gunmen burst into a bar in the village of Greysteel, shouted trick or treat, and opened fire. The UFF retaliated by walking into the Rising Sun pub in Greysteel and just shooting dead seven um, innocent people. How did you react to that? On that particular day, if the UFF had walked into a picture house or something on the Falls Road and killed 300 people, I'd have been quite happy. It's amazing the feelings that are in you. Anybody, anybody on the Shankill Road on that day, from a Boy Scout deck Rally on the Shankill Road that day, if you'd have given them a gun, they would have went out and retaliated. There was no, 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 no problem about that. That was shattering because we had been at a stage where we were moving into political talking and we had led down a lot of criteria and Grace Steele blasted it out of the water totally. Despite the horrors, the peace process moved forward. Six weeks later, loyalists got what they wanted when the British and Irish Prime Ministers outlined a political settlement. It made clear that there would be no constitutional change without the agreement of the majority of the people of Northern Ireland. It was known as the principle of consent. There is an opportunity to end violence for good in Northern Ireland. We believe that it's now up to those who've used or supported violence to take that opportunity. But loyalists still feared a backdoor deal with the IRA. Archbishop Eames went to number 10 to seek personal reassurance. I looked John Major straight in the eye and I said, can I go back to these people? And can I tell them that you have not done a secret deal with the IRA? Can you give me your word of honour? I'm an Archbishop, you're Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And I simply said, please John, don't, don't lie to me. He looked me straight in the eye and he said, you have my word. I said, that's all I want. I said, history will judge us both. I went back and I met them again. And I said, I am convinced the Prime Minister of Great Britain has not done a secret deal with the IRA. And they said, that's all we want to know. But another blow almost derailed the peace process. It came the following year after Republican gunmen shot dead a senior UVF commander, Trevor King. He was standing on the Shankill Road talking to two other men. They also died. Trevor King is commemorated every year. Roy McGee was nearby when the shooting happened. He was with the UVF at the time. You could see that the leadership of the UVF were quite naturally very, very broken and disturbed about the shooting of their colleague. And uh, one could uh, imagine that there would be reprisals of some description as a result of what had happened. The reprisals came two days later at a pub in the tiny village of Lockin Island. Customers were watching the World Cup. UVF gunmen sprayed the bar, shooting dead 87-year-old Barney Green and five other Catholics. 
But despite the brutality of such attacks, some loyalists still seek to explain them away. That's cold-blooded murder. What else is it? I call it retaliation, which is not quite the same thing. And, uh, but you end up with dead Catholics who are innocent. In retaliation for dead Protestants who are lying on the Shankill Road. Yes, I could do that. But that doesn't justify the death of innocent Catholics, does it? If you're sending a message out to the, the IRA that if you kill a Protestant, someone is going to pay for this here. Now, it may be crude, and it's, it's vicious, but the end may well justify the means. After Lockin Island, there was much soul-searching within the UVF leadership. It's unlikely the massacre was authorised from the top, but it wasn't necessary, as local units could act with a degree of autonomy. I said to myself, how can this be when they are talking peace? And so within hours of that dreadful atrocity happening, I was in touch with them to say, explain this to me. Because if you don't explain it to my satisfaction, you can forget about it. What was your reaction to Lockin Island? Worst day of my life. Worst day of my life. You've been asking people to put the guns away. That included your own people. The UVF did Lockin Island. Yeah, well... Slaughtered six innocent Catholics in a bar. I don't know how I could remotely describe how I felt or how many around me felt. We really felt we were getting somewhere. Really felt we were getting somewhere. It was beginning to happen, beginning to fall into place. And then bang. And at that time, David contacted me. And I really told him that I felt like walking away from it because I felt that they had honeyed words. I was beginning not to trust, or I was beginning not to believe what they were saying. However, he reassured me that what he had initially said to me was true, that what they were trying to achieve was peace, and for me not to walk away from it. My contacts were sufficiently sure in their own minds that uh, it was worth going on with it. So you did? Yes, I did. Secret talks were also being conducted on the Republican side, and they finally produced the long-awaited IRA ceasefire. The leadership of the IRA have decided that as of midnight August 31st, there will be a complete cessation of military operations. The IRA had been moving in this direction for several years, recognizing that one day politics would replace the gun. But loyalists see it differently. I believe the UFF strategy brought Sinn Féin to the negotiating table because they couldn't handle the pressure that was being put on them by their people. But Sinn Féin were on their way to the negotiating table anyway. What yes. the UFF did might have been a factor, but that wasn't the reason they declared a ceasefire and entered talks. We believe it was a major factor. What did the Loyalist paramilitaries achieve? The Loyalist paramilitaries achieved something which perhaps the security forces would never have achieved, and that was they were a, a significant contribution to the IRA finally accepting that they couldn't win. In the wake of the IRA ceasefire, there were expectations that loyalists would also let their guns fall silent. But there were internal differences. Not all felt they should follow suit, especially when they believed they had the IRA on the run. Did you support the Loyalist ceasefire? I went along with it because the Loyalists had called it. But were you personally in favour of it? At that particular time, I thought it was called a bit too soon. That was my opinion. But the view that won the day was that it was now time for loyalists to put their guns away. 
When I first joined the organization, I joined the organization because Republicans was attacking our communities. They end up stated, once they stop, we will stop. And that was the case when they called our ceasefire. We had to stop. Six weeks after the IRA's ceasefire, the Loyalists called theirs. It was announced by the UVF veteran Gusty Spence. He'd been convicted of murder way back in 1966. In all sincerity, in all sincerity, we offer to the loved ones of all innocent victims over the past 25 years object yeah. of true remorse. When you announced the Loyalist ceasefire, why did you say what you did? Because it was the most obvious, the most humane, and the most logical thing to say. Through an abject remorse. It has to be said. Society has to say it to, to all aspects. All aspects of society have to say it to each other. Individuals have to say it. Groups have to say it. Abject and true remorse. Did he speak for you? Absolutely. Without doubt. Without doubt. Here was the Alpha and Omega, perceived by many to be the first Gusty Spence, part of the uh, first violent men of this recent era, and reading out a statement that pulled the curtain down, or we hope would pull the curtain down, on a, a brutal and awful past. I think one of the great lessons out of this whole process which may be incidental to the result, but nonetheless important in human terms, is the capacity for personal redemption. The ability of people who have made serious, tragic errors, violent errors, committed brutal atrocities, to accept responsibility, to be punished for it, to accept their punishment, and then to change genuinely changed. Despite the ceasefires, confrontation was not over. It simply moved to a different setting, Drumcree Church. The issue was now marching, not killing. It was forced not by the loyalist paramilitaries, but by the Orangemen, pillars of respectability within the Protestant community. They demanded the right to march home through a nationalist area, which the residents found provocative. Although a compromise was reached, the Orangemen saw it as a great victory. David Trimble and Ian Paisley glowed in their triumph. We are delighted to be back down the traditional route, as we expect to be again. Yeah! The predominant feeling was one of relief because I'd realised earlier in that day that uh, we were facing a major crisis. Uh, it, the situation was incredibly serious. We'd so managed to resolve it. Now, when we'd got safely home, back to the Orange Hall, uh, then, uh, yes, the, the brethren showed their pleasure uh, by applauding uh, myself and Ian Paisley. And I was very happy to acknowledge their applause. The lasting image of you on that day is one of David Trimble, the exulting, loyalist, triumphant. That's how it came across. It has been so portrayed. That's what the pictures show. It has been so portrayed. And Republican propagandists have made considerable mileage out of their misrepresentation of the situation. <laughs> The following year, there was a rerun of the confrontation at Drum Cree, but now with paramilitary menace. It came from Billy Wright, the notorious leader of the local UVF, known as King Rat. Wright supported the local Orangemen, who once again faced a standoff with the nationalist residents. Although the UVF was on ceasefire, Wright was prepared to use violence to force the issue.
Wright is believed to have ordered the killing of a local Catholic taxi driver. It was a clear breach of the UVF ceasefire. The killing shook the community and shattered the family. As I bury my son, both of you bury your pride. I don't want any mother or father going through what my wife and I have went through today. I've watched my daughter-in-law, I've watched my grandchild go through hell. Don't do it. Please stop this. Bury your pride with my boy. To those who have done this, my family forgive you. As a result of the killing, Wright was expelled from the UVF by its leadership in Belfast for breaking its ceasefire. There were also fears that Wright was establishing a rival leadership in Portadown. He was ordered to leave the province on pain of death. Controversially, he shared a platform with one of Ian Paisley's MPs and declared he wasn't going anywhere. To the adulation of his supporters, Wright became a living loyalist martyr. I will not believe in Ulster. I will not change my mind about what I believe is happening in Ulster. And all I would like to say is that it has broken my heart to think that fellow loyalists would turn their guns on me. And I have to ask them, for whom are you doing it? Thank you. Shortly afterwards, Wright set up a rival organisation. The LVF had no time for ceasefires, and Wright soon found himself in jail. With Billy Wright behind bars and Sinn Féin now involved in all party talks, there was a dramatic incident inside the Mays prison. Billy Wright was in a van waiting to go for a visit. Republican prisoners escaped from their wing, ran to the van and shot Billy Wright dead. I was deeply concerned. I knew immediately that there would be retaliation. It uh, was inevitable. Uh, I think that the setback of December of 1997 was the most difficult of all to take because hopes had been, for the first time, high. Wright's death triggered more tit-for-tat killings. A UDA man and close friend of Jackie MacDonald's was shot dead. The UFF retaliated, breaking its ceasefire. We came into being because of what the IRA was doing to this country. And if we tried our way in, we agreed to hold a ceasefire. Uh, but once people attack us, knowing we are in ceasefire, we still have to respond against the people who attack us. Inside the maze, UFF prisoners announced they were withdrawing their support for the peace process. Bobby Philpott and other members of the UFF leadership in the prison had met their political representatives. They'd instructed them to withdraw from the all-party talks. The peace process looked set to collapse. We had tried to negotiate with the prisoners who had said that they were withdrawing support from the peace process. Uh, and, quite frankly, would failed, which was an indictment upon us. Uh, we travelled to London. We talked to him and we made her aware of how serious the situation was. I've seen negotiating ploys of this is serious, this is serious, and this was different. They were seriously in trouble and they were, to say deeply concerned, doesn't express what was almost fear. And they said, we can't make the prisoners believe what we're saying. You say it to us, they don't believe us. Will you go and say it to them? So I checked with civil servants and went. Her decision was attacked by critics who accused her of playing the terrorist game.
Inside, she met the leadership of the UFF, including the notorious killer from East Belfast, Michael Stone. Stone, with the ponytail, was serving life for his attack on the mourners at Milltown Cemetery. At the meeting with Mo Molum, Bobby Philpott was one of those who spoke on behalf of the UFF. I remember her being so straight and talking with us and the way she put her case over. Dr. Merlin convinced you that the union was secure, did you? She did, yes. Which is what you wanted to hear? Which, which, which I wanted to hear. What would have happened if Dr. Molan had not come into the prison to talk to you? If that had been the case, we would have seen it as another slap in the face for loyalism. And we would have no other alternative but to seek a meeting with the UFF leadership and to put our view that we believe now is the time to return to war. Back to the war. A, a war that on a greater scale than any time before. To the relief of the UFF's political representatives, Dr. Molan had persuaded the UFF prisoners to stay on side. By early spring, there were signs of an emerging agreement. Ian Paisley and his party campaigned passionately against it. Historically, the Loyalist paramilitaries marched alongside Ian Paisley, but now they were ranged against him. Gary McMichael came to Lisbon Orange Hall to challenge Paisley in public and ask him to spell out the alternative. He was not a welcome visitor. Paisley was in my time. I was elected representative in Lisburn. He came to Lisburn Orange Hall to tell the people of Lisburn about uh, the dangers of the agreement, the potential agreement, about to warn them off this and to tell them that they were getting sold out by people like me. And I wouldn't let him get away with that. So I went to offer my view. And I wasn't allowed to speak. I was harangued, chased almost from the from the orange hall. There was no room for debate about this issue. Paisley had flirted with the Loyalist paramilitaries on and off for almost 30 years. Now the relationship was over. An historic agreement for peace in Northern Ireland has been reached within the past few minutes. The Good Friday Agreement gave both sides the key elements of what they wanted. Unionists got the guarantee of consent and nationalists got cross-border bodies. Both were to share power in a new Northern Ireland Assembly. The key issue of the decommissioning of terrorist weapons was fudged. How did you feel? Uh, yes, I was, I, was, I, was, I was content in my own mind that we'd done the right thing. I felt that it was the saddest day that Ulster has ever had since the finding of the province. David Trimble and Ian Paisley no longer hold hands together. Paisley is convinced that Trimble and the agreement will fall. 
traitor and treachery together. In the referendum on the agreement, Paisley campaigned with all his old vigour to secure a no vote. This agreement is not just flawed, it is rotten to the core. There are many who would see you, Ian Paisley, as the person who fanned the flames of the Troubles, the person who was the wrecker, the person who always said no, that's how they will see you. Well, uh, they can say what they like about me. I uh, will not be here when they're saying that, so it will not affect me or my eternal whereabouts. But let me tell you something. We'll be saying no on the 27th of May. All I can say is I'll not be changing. I will go to the grave with the conviction I have. I would like to introduce you to two men who are making history. The referendum was held north and south. In the south, support was nearly unanimous. In the north, almost three quarters of the whole population voted yes. But significantly, nearly half the Protestant population voted no. Even amongst those who have uncertainties and dislikes about the agreement, even amongst those who voted no, there is at heart a realisation that there is no alternative. In the elections for the new assembly, politicians representing the loyalist paramilitaries did not fare well. The UVFs won two seats and the UDAs didn't win any. Nevertheless, both organisations have decided to maintain their ceasefires and continue their support for the Good Friday Agreement. Is the war over? As far as, as, far as loyalism is concerned, yeah. There's no need to, to, to persecute any further war. Of course the war's over. Because the agreement guarantees the Union as long as the majority so wish it, there is a sense in which the Loyalists have won. I think the Union is safe. You couldn't ask for any more than to have the, the future of the country in your own hands, really. Why is the Union safe? Because as long as the people of Northern Ireland wish it, they will remain part of the Union. Who has made the Union safe? Well, I would take great pride in believing and thinking and saying that our organisation has played a great part in this. It's a long way from marching through the streets with Master Balaclavas, isn't it? Absolutely, and I was there on many occasions marching Balaclavas, defended Ulster at its time of need and went to many rallies. But I think 30 years is enough. People are, are tired of the, of the violence of the conflict and I want to see a new society for the children and for future children. If there's never another shot fired, it will be too soon. You won't miss the excitement? I will not miss the excitement. The danger? No, I will not miss the excitement or the danger. The adrenaline? No. I want an end to it if it's over. If someone in all sides will declare the war over, I will rejoice. And I look forward to the day, whether it will ever come in my lifetime, I don't know, but I look forward to the day when I will have a pint on the Falls Road. It's something to look forward to, wouldn't it? But behind such optimism lie three centuries of sectarian hate, made ever deeper by three decades of bloodshed. The absence of widespread bombing and killing does not mean peace. The agreement was long fought for, 
and the principles it represents will take far longer to take root. On the 12th of July, the loyalist day of days, there's a chilling reminder of how far there is to go. Loyalists find such songs shocking. They're part of a community's culture, fashioned by long years of suffering and hate. The other side has its sectarian songs too, the legacy of a past that most hope will never return. Such songs would horrify many Protestants, but they do reflect the dark forces that three decades of political violence have unleashed. Let's get the Loyalist paramilitaries have always argued that they did what they did on behalf of and in defence of their community. Did they? Well... I believe that they did, but electorally, of course, they don't get the results. But I'm quite sure that organizations like the UDA and the UVF had a lot of sympathy in the heartland of Ulster Protestantism. And support for what they did. Protestants don't like saying that they support terrorism, and most Protestants would certainly abhor terrorism, but there would be an element who would have a sneaking regard for what the UDA and UVF were doing. It's astonishing to hear a unionist politician of such standing voice the thoughts that many Protestants may have harboured but never been prepared to admit. It's a reflection of moral ambivalence, the result of living through the darkest years of the conflict. Can you live with those people that you have tried for so many years to kill? Well, if we don't live together, we'll die together. Graves bear witness to the suffering Loyalists have inflicted over 30 years and more. If peace falls apart, there will be a return to this dreadful past. The guns are still there. Loyalists hope the war is over but remain ready if it is not.